Well, I'm not sure if this has always been the case. Pre-cure manga runs in the Nakayoshi magazine always seem to end on New Year's chapters. I bring this up because I do kind of wonder if they're still going to do it this year with Healing Good due to the pandemic delays. Like, did they end up holding back a few chapters because Asumi only just joined the team recently? I don't know, but I do plan on covering those manga when they come out, so we'll see for ourselves, I guess. But for now, let's take a look at three more chapters of the Bohotsukai pre tier manga and see if they can end their New Year's on a peaceful note, while ours is, um... Still to be determined, uh... The 11th chapter of these books open with our protagonist returning to the magical world, having gotten an invitation to a fashion contest. Said invite probably should have included a dress code because wow, Demira and her all striped clothing stick out like a sore thumb in such an environment. I think even Waldo would say she's overdoing it. Mulford even know that the stripes extended to all uh, uh no. Uh, just like to remind everyone out there that Mofrun is indeed a girl, so yeah, just want you to throw that out there. <laughs> Anyway, the person who had invited them was their classmate from the magical school, June. She was planning on entering the fashion contest herself and needed a model. Specifically, a certain prison school cosplayer. Yeah, as crazy as it sounded, she did at least have a plan. Basically, present her friend as a before and after case, showing how she could take an absolute fashion disaster and turn her into an A-list model. Well, before anything else, you should probably learn how to use Photoshop. For June, she wanted to lead a revolution in fashion, having been inspired by the accomplishments of Marie Antoinette. Uh, yeah, last time I checked, Marie never had a ship on her head like that, just a giant jellyfish. Also, I'm not totally sure if revolutions and Marie Antoinette mix all that well, just saying. Still, Mirai of course gave her the okay, and thus they tried on her dress of a literal college dorm dress. Well, um, at least it's somewhat practical as she can now carry her books on her head instead of in a backpack. Yeah, Kota probably put it best when she pointed out you really shouldn't need an instruction manual to figure out how to put on a dress. However, Mirai liked it and even tried to add on to it with a much longer cape. No kicks! Liko seemed to agree and changed her into what I think is my personal favorite dress of this chapter as it was really cute, refined, and of course didn't have all the frivolous and probably literal bells and whistles of June's dress. Kota's design wasn't bad either, though I'm not sure if this would count as a dress, especially if you have to water it constantly. Obviously, this led into a three-way battle between the fashionista witches as they forcibly played dress up with their friend. Thankfully, they were stopped by Francois, whom I haven't mentioned yet, but came with June and was the owner of a clothing shop in the magical world. He rightfully pointed out that while Marie Antoinette did try to be bold with her clothing, she and Coco Chanel also tried to make practical and comfortable clothing for everyone. Alright, a little off subject here, but anyone else getting a bit of a rarity takes Manhattan vibe from all this? I mean, you've got a fashion contest, a designer who manipulates and abuses her friends, and a Coco Chanel reference. Hopefully this doesn't lead to any more copyright issues for the twins like it did with MLP. Oh, it's Pamela! Anyway, he of course said that the most important thing a dress should convey more than aesthetic pleasure should be actual smiles. June realized the error of her ways and how she was basically making a dress that was only adhering to her own sensibilities. I think that's a lesson a lot more creative types should take to heart. Not going to name any names, because quite frankly there's too many. And she kindly asked her friends if they could help her make a new dress from scratch, which of course they said yes to. The next day at the fashion show, they were having a Cirque du Soleil theme, I think? Okay, seriously, I would dress up in more than just my PJs if we had fashion shows like this in the real world. Anyway, they performed their before and after shot on the runway with Mirai coming out in her stripes, and then June casting a spell to dress her up. Um, in a cute dress. I mean, I still think I prefer Liko's solo design, but I do like the symbolism of this dress integrating all three girls' aesthetics while being also entirely functional and not a tall fashion bomb. I'm just not personally sold on the asymmetrical design myself. Still, whatever. The judges liked it, and good god, you can poke an eye out with that hat lady. Well, anyway, they liked it, and the chapter ended with Shun taking her first steps towards leading a revolution in fashion. 
And before we get to the aforementioned New Year's chapter, we of course got a Christmas special first. No, not like that one. Also, seriously, Disney? But yeah, we opened on Mofood, enjoying some traditional Christmas foods like chicken, pie, and uh... Very bubbly grape juice. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so now just forget about the fact that this bear's human form is that of a little girl. Man, Mover is surprisingly problematic. Anyway, Mirai gave stockings to all of her friends for Santa to stuff presents in. However, Liko brought up a good point that stuffed animals that were inanimate up until recently might not be on his list. Thus, our heroines did the most sensible thing and dressed up like Santa's to deliver her present. Okay, the Martian might be okay with this, but I'm not so sure about the fat man. Yeah, I'm never going to get tired of mentioning the fact that this franchise has more than one incarnation of Saint Nick. Also, nice to see someone in this franchise understands the importance of current events. Anyway, Mira and her friends snuck into her own house. Yeah, I think you guys are kind of overcomplicating things just a little. Also, you probably should have bought a less hairy beard as she ended up sneezing and waking up Mulford, giving us yet another fantastic reaction face from this bear. Of course, Mirai tried to keep up the act by saying that they were just newbie Santas in training. Well, I guess if it works in Caldia, why not? By the way, JP Bear get Ryder Elena this year. They gave Mofu in her presents, starting with the physical item of a really cute dress for her. Again, I prefer refined yet not overly complicated designs like this. And then some magical gifts based around their motifs with Mirai giving her the miracle of fun and Liko giving her the magical freedom to go where she wanted. I gotta give this manga credit, it's one of the very few stories nowadays that actually brought in some Jesus Christ symbolism. But yeah, thanks to some special Christmas magic, the three wise cures could each cast one special spell each, resulting in Mofurun being able to fly and make her dress shine like a Christmas tree. As for Kota's spell of fleece or happiness, it was an obvious bit of foreshadowing for later. Though regardless, they decided to head out for a little bit of fun. Thanks to their spells, Mofurun was able to fly around as though she was holding hands with a snowman. Then again, without the snowman, they ended up running into a little trouble as the crows from this manga's very first chapter had returned, this time targeting Mofurun because of her shiny dress. Naturally, Mirai tried to cancel out the spell so that they could escape into the dark night, but their special Christmas magic couldn't be overwritten until the end of the night. Of course, they also tried to just repel the crows, but I guess these birds were still upset that they never got to be in a Hitchcock film. Left with no other options, they told Mofurun to just lose the shiny dress since that's what they really wanted. However, Mofurun didn't want to just throw away the gift their friends had put so much work into to make sure she had the best Christmas possible. Luckily though, the power of obvious foreshadowing saved the day as flowers began to bloom all over her dress and that somehow calmed the crows down. Because, as we all know, crows love to stop and smell the flowers? Eh, whatever. This was still a really cute chapter, and especially good as a Christmas story that again managed to work in some subtle allusions to the understated origins of the holiday. In that sense, this is probably one of the best manga Christmas stories I've ever read, so good job there. With that, the chapter ended with Mofurun flying on the winged backs of her new crow friends, and Mirai still tried to pull off the Santa act. And thus, we reached the faded New Year's chapter with Mirai trying to wake up her friends to celebrate the dawn of a new morning. However, she couldn't find either of them, and Mofurun wasn't talking. Ooh, is this going to lead to like some kind of big mystery where Mirai has to use all of her wits to try and rescue her friends, and oh never mind, it was just a dream. <sighs> It was all a dream. I wouldn't say that. I mean, yeah, it's going to play a very significant part in the plot of this story, but come on guys, let's not make a habit of this. Anyway, to welcome in the new year, our trio made their way to their local shrine. Along the way, they discussed their first dreams of the year, which Liko pointed out some believe could be prophetic, which naturally caught Mirai's ear. And while her friends were able to share all their pleasant dreams about their futures, Mirai couldn't bring herself to talk about hers. Eh, just tell them that some creepy cat god voiced by Norio Wakamoto invade your dreams and they'll understand. 
Of course, since they were at a shrine, Mirai took every opportunity she could to get some good luck. However, once she got to the Omikuji, she got the dreaded... Naijo! And yet, in spite of getting dozens of these same fortunes, she could only bring herself to make the standard glass mask face. You know Miyuki is looking at this girl and saying, Kid, you still got ways to go. The three continued their celebrations with some traditional Hanitsuki, a uh, sort of Japanese badminton with no net as smaller shuttlecock. And while she wasn't totally into it due to all of her misfortune, Miyai proved to be a really strong player and was spared the penalty game that saw the loser get their face drawn on with some ink. Once again, Liko, the resident dropper of exposition, explained how inking the loser's face was meant to help ward off misfortune. Figuring that she could use this superstition to her advantage, Miyai decided to throw the game to get some of that ink or cast a spell to make sure she lost. Yeah, I think you're kind of overcomplicating things there, Miyai. But it didn't matter to her, because in her mind, the more ink she had on her face, the more friends she could keep. This resulted in the birth of Cure Gongoro. Sadly, we don't get to see any more of her after this chapter. Seriously, Toy, between this, Cure Mofun, and Cure Sports, y'all really need to use your lesser known cures a little more. Anyway, the fact that the shuttlecock was avoiding Mirai like Disney avoids originality these days, didn't escape legal, and she erased all of her precious ink. Left with no other choice, Mirai had to come clean about what she was worried about. Of course, Liko didn't believe Mirai's dream would come true exactly like it did, but she did also have to acknowledge that they would have to part ways eventually, as they did literally come from two different worlds. And the fact that Mirai ended up bringing this up mostly through her own selfish actions didn't sit well with Liko, who just wanted to enjoy their New Year's. As a result, Liko and Kota walked off on her, but her best bear friend was still there for her, and also reminded her of what her name meant, Miai or Future in English. You might know this if you've seen Mamoru Hosta's latest and not quite as good film. I didn't say it was bad, just not up to his usual standards, okay? The point is, her name was meant to act as a constant reminder to always look towards the future, likely with a more optimistic view. With that, Mirai got all of her friends together and gave them a proper New Year's greeting that looks a little more Christmassy than anything else. Also, is that public property? Nah, whatever, they can always clean it up later, as Liko gave her a big hug saying that she forgave her. Moreover, she assured her that while they would likely have to part ways at some point, that would just make their eventual reunion all the sweeter. In fact, Liko was already thinking of ways that would get their two worlds to have stronger connections that would allow them to meet again. With that, Koto also provided her own New Year's greeting in the form of a rainless rainbow, and the chapter ended with the three witches flying over it and enjoying the here and now while also looking forward towards a brighter future. Considering that these are the last three chapters of the Behold Sky Precure's monthly magazine run, I think they might have saved the best for last. I mean, not only were they all kind of touching little tales, they also had some pretty deep subtext to them. Be it about the kind of origins of modern fashion, Christmas, or the Japanese New Year, all of it was told in a very efficient and engaging little pace, while never forgetting to also highlight its characters. I think one of the things I really like about the twins' writing is their emphasis on how people should interact with one another. Be it through stuff like compromises, appreciation, or of course, just general respect and affection for one another. The fashion chapter, on top of reminding me of one of my favorite MLP episodes, took some of the better principles of Marie Antoinette and Coco Chanel to encourage the idea of making a product everyone can enjoy. The Christmas chapter saw Mofun going out of her way to show her appreciation for a gift that her friends made while really getting into the spirit of the holiday. And the New Year's chapter promoted the idea of just enjoying our times with others through fun activities which don't include using magic to purposely lose. These were all poignant stories that highlighted some of the most amiable elements of these characters while not disregarding their flaws either. It's actually kind of refreshing to see these characters act a little selfishly because, well, they have access to magic of course. Just as long as they learn how to use their spells properly by the end, it makes for good little arcs even for characters who only now have a role in this manga. Yeah, if I had to complain about anything, I guess I could say that some characters maybe needed a little more panel time, 
Kota played a very minor role in these chapters after being the focus for a while, but that's really just a nitpick, and the stories and the art were just great, and this manga matched it and its original magazine run on a pretty high note in my opinion. Next time though, it's going to be no holds barred. No, not like that! I mean, maybe kind of like that, but not exactly on... Well, point is, we're going to take a look at the actual final chapter exclusive to this Tonko Bone. I just hope this website lets me put it up. Well, anyway, look forward to it, and until then, though, for now, my friends, and... Ooh, sounds like someone got some more Daikyos. I better get my camera ready.